move on now to our 32nd study period here at the British Columbian Camp 1983 and we're just considering now some principles in regard to the formation or organisation of this movement and um, we're making the point of course that uh, the cry in regard to a one man messenger is really a, a complaint against what God is doing in the building of this movement and um, my personal dedication to this work is found in the um, book of Jeremiah chapter 1 Jeremiah chapter 1 and um, this is this is I love this this um, text because it shows exactly what uh, every true messenger of God is to be Jeremiah chapter 1 we start with verse 6 then said I, Our Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Now, <clears throat> the concern of God's messengers and I have been very, very dedicated to this principle, is not to be jealous for position, but simply ask the question day by day, what am I to say today, and where am I to go today? And we go where God sends us, and we, and we say what God tells us to say, and that's the beginning and the end of our responsibility. And we leave everybody else in the movement to um, be used of God as God sees fit to use them, and we cooperate with those whom God calls in this way, and we have found the most wonderful coordination between all those folk around the world whom God has called to be workers in, in one capacity, capacity or the other. And you folk can all testify from your own personal experience, I don't come amongst you as a Lord and Master, I come amongst you as a servant, and nothing else but a servant. And you're left with the most absolute and complete freedom to build your Christian experience in your environment the way God directs you to build it, or the way in which you may choose to build it. I hope only the way God directs you to build it. Now it's very, very interesting to find <laughs> I always have to smile about this because um, every now and again a person rebels against the message because of pride usually. <clears throat> For instance, I'm thinking of one man and um, he, had, he, he was in the movement for 20 years, would you believe it? 20 years from 1960, oh, about 1962 to about 1982. 20 years pretty much exactly. Now this man was... Um, fairly on in years uh, he retired um, <clears throat> during the period and today he's probably I say around about 70 years of age and for many <clears throat> for many years if anyone had a complaint or, or a grievance or felt the movement ought to be reorganized they used to go to him and he was the unofficial problem solver for the movement I never took mine to him I took mine to God of course so I always have done that and um, then came the message on God is our problem solver and our plan maker and interestingly enough uh, those people who used to who beat a track to his door seemed to catch, catch the idea and even the one or two of them who didn't go along with the Sabbath rest principles too well quit going to his place and suddenly he found himself uh, isolated and adrift with, without the status which he had previously enjoyed and of course what he should have done when the message on Sabbath rest came through he should have recognised they'd been fulfilling a role that God never gave to him and he ought to have repented from the depths of his heart in regard to that, uh, that position and if, he, if he'd done that of course it, it would be a much healthier kind of situation altogether but instead of repenting of the role he'd played he now began to commiserate with himself because he'd lost status and now he, um, he sought to regain status by um, finding another work for himself which eventually turned out to be well first of all he made a great clamour that there should be clinics all over the countryside until we had clinics in every little town and operators in those clinics treating the worldly people Christ would never come again I said go ahead and do it I said I'm, 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 it's not my work I said if God has laid upon you such a work go ahead and do it but no he had no interest in doing that because <clears throat> the whole thing was to create an issue and to uh, recover his lost status and um when that didn't recover his lost status then he turned to um, sending out tapes by the self-appointed workers like Wheeling and Santee and Bauer and Grothier and so on now these tapes are mainly 
um, messages of condemnation and criticism against the Seventh-day Adventist Church, as you probably know if you've read, if you've heard any of them. But they're in tremendous demand because people love to, they feel good if they're criticizing somebody. And very soon they're sending out thousands of these tapes and then he said, now I feel important again. Now, at the same time he said, and I have escaped from Fred Rice domination. Which made me laugh because he was very happy to listen to the message when I went to his place. He'd say more studies and I had to give study after study at his place. He loved the message, but this cry that they have escaped from my domination is a ludicrous one because you all can testify that I don't dominate any of you. Do I? Right. If I do say so, and I'll stop right away. <laughs> That's amazing how, how the mind changes when, <clears throat> when a person loses his grip on the message. Right, so to come back anyway to the Brinsmead movement, um, up until 1950, there, while there had been a steadily deepening apostasy in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the members largely retained an unbroken faith in the General Conference. And they said, well, the standards are falling, the problems are there, but the General Conference is going to solve these problems. And, and any of you... <laughs> Any of you folk who are older Adventists along with myself remember those days and the attitude was taken up. But about 1950, there came a sudden change in the attitude of the lay people, or many of the lay people, because they suddenly recognised that the General Conference was not cleaning up the problems, that things were going from bad to worse. And um, the average Adventist began, well, many, well, quite a number of Adventists began to say, well, something's got to be done, let's do something. The old cry went up, let's do something. So again, instead of getting in upon their knees and saying, now Lord, you're the problem solver, you do something to clean up this mess, the people then felt that they themselves had to do something about it. And they started off by, um, well, started off by leaders, opportunists who, who, who kind of had a, had a burden likewise to see things change, standing up and uh, gathering around themselves a group which grew large, well, quite large in some cases, and these folk then began to make the common mistake of reforming the thorn bush. They did, they did not have a message in regard to the eradication of the old nature. And, the, and so they read, uh, one man for instance got his whole family reading the, the testimonies through and every time they found a thou shalt do this and thou shalt not do that, they, they wrote it down. They had pages and pages and pages of thou shalt nots and thou shalts, which of course is legalistic religion. And the next thing they come out with... Um, all kinds of weird costumes in some cases and um, freak diets and uh, and so forth. Freak diets. Yeah, freak diets is right in some cases. And um, quite a number of these movements sprang up across the country. And and today, of course, every one of those movements that, that existed back then, every one of them has died. They've disappeared off the face of the earth, which of course is clear proof they were not a God-directed organisation or development or reformation. But... Um, at the same time as this was going on, other events were happening in the world field. About 1950, two men, Will and Short, came back from their mission station in Africa to attend a ministerial institute in Washington, D.C. And at this ministerial institute, a, a so-called Christ-centered emphasis was given to the meetings, but Will and Short became deeply concerned about the so-called Christ-centered emphasis because they saw it was really a false Christ-centered emphasis, very much so. And these two men <coughs> went to the, um, the General Conference and uh, expressed their deep concern over these trends, their very deep concern. And um, they, they said we should go back and pick up the message that God gave on Christ and His righteousness back in 1888 through Wagner and Jones. Well, the GC leader said, well, this is interesting. We'd like you men to go away and put all this down in writing and give it to us in writing so we can carefully go over it and uh, give it very, very, very thorough consideration. So William and Short went away and produced a manuscript entitled 1888 Reexamined, um, which later, which with later addition, additions, be became known as a warning and its perception. I'll tell you what that was in a few moments. Now they, they presented this manuscript to the General Conference Committee and the main argument in this manuscript was that back in 1888, God had sent the loud cry message. That had been rejected and been replaced by a false Christ doctrine 
that, and that not until the church went back and took up the message which God had given to give the loud cry could the, could the Adventist church ever be, be given the blessing of the latter rain and give the loud cry. Now the brethren recognised the point and in their reply to Whittle and Short they very plainly said now you have made the point that unless there is this repentance then of course the work cannot be finished and they said we deny that necessity we utterly deny your point they said God has never required us to repent for the sins of a bygone generation God never did require that they said all we have to do is to make sure that we're on the right track today and we're doing famously as you know of course we're, one, we're, we're rich and increased with goods we have need of nothing we're right down the middle of the road and God's blessing us and we're the, we're the remnant church and God's peculiar people and there's no need to go back to 1888 at all now I stand amazed that those leaders in the Adventist church who are supposed to know their Bibles from cover to cover could ever turn around and say God never required an existing generation to repent of a past generation's sins Let's turn to, for instance, to Leviticus chapter 26 and um, let's just see what God does require of an existing generation in respect to the sins of a, past, uh, of a bygone generation. Le um, Leviticus 26 and verse 14. All right, now have you, got, have you, have you all got it? I'd like, you, I'd like you to see these words with your own eyes today. And the text says, <clears throat> If they shall confess their iniquity... <clears throat> Okay, very well. And what follows? And the iniquity of their fathers. Their fathers. Right? If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers. Now, the general conference says that God never requires us to confess the sins of our fathers. What does the Bible say? If they do, what then? Then God says, I'll remember my covenant, I'll bless them, I'll restore them, and all those wonderful things along the way. Now, when your mind runs ahead to the experience of good King Hezekiah and the reference is found in uh, 2 Chronicles 29 verses 5 to 11, 2 Chronicles 29 verses 5 to 11, you'll find that King Hezekiah, when he came to the throne and planned to um, reinstitute the Passover, first of all knelt down and confessed his sins and the sins of his fathers. And if you read the story of Ezra and Nehemiah, you find the same thing. If you read the story of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, you find the same thing. And when those men confessed the sins of their fathers, the apostasy of their fathers, what followed? A tremendous outpouring of blessing. A marvellous outpouring of blessing. Now, of course, there is a half-truth or a certain truth in what those general conference leaders said. Now, for instance, God does not require us to to confess the specific individual sins of our fathers such as if my father committed murder for instance I don't have to confess that not unless I was participant in the crime or such like um, because each person is accountable for the, for the sins which he has uh, which he has committed but when my fathers uh, reject the truth of God and turn into the path of apostasy and I walk with my fathers in that path of apostasy then to what point do I have to go back in my confession to the point of departure and that point of departure is my father's sins right and I must confess <clears throat> I must confess that point of departure and so the general conference flatly rejected the appeals of Will and Short and no sooner had they done this and along came the evangelical leaders Barnhouse and Martin and proposed to the Adventists that they have some conversations and answer some questions and as a result of those conversations of course the Adventist church came out with a very modified sanctuary message they now officially taught that Jesus Christ came in sinless flesh and blood they openly said that they and the Protestant churches were in perfect harmony on this truth on, on, I shouldn't say this, on this subject and um, thereby the Adventist church was literally calling themselves Babylon calling themselves Babylon let me make that point clear in fact in, um, in Froome's book he reports this in the book called The Movement of Destiny he tells how that um, uh, was, uh, English the um, great evangelical writer had plainly said that in, in his humanity Christ was, was um, what's the exact words again that, that he was sinless anyway he was sinless in his humanity and when, when English had made this point very clearly and plainly, then Froome said, and we assured him that that in turn is precisely what we believe. So he said to the Protestant church, what you believe in the nature of Christ, we likewise believe in the nature of Christ. 
So the Adventist Church fully identified with Babylon by her own words back then in the mid-50s. Now, when the... Um, when Whelan and Short were told by the General Conference they could not accept their message, the answer was given in writing, and later Al Hassan took the manuscript called 1888 we examined and added into it the General Conference's reply, Whelan and Short's next reply, and the final reply given by the General Conference, and this compilation of the original manuscript plus these, these replies and counter-replies is now called A Warning and Its Reception a book which is voluntarily out of print, unfortunately, and which cannot be obtained any longer. We just might get busy in printing down in Australia and a few thousand copies off. But it's a big and expensive undertaking. We, we, uh, we'll see about doing it. Maybe yes, maybe no. You can still get the 1888 uh, message, the re-examined, 1888 re-examined in the States. Can you get one? Not without the reply and all that. Yeah, well, you've, got to, you've got to tell... Uh, Grothier has a few copies, but he won't give them to him unless you tell him who you are and what you want them for. And when you tell him who you are and which ones he wants them to you. No, I got them from another place. Oh, did you? Yeah. Can you get one more? Have you got a spare one? Oh, yeah. Have you got a spare one? At home, yeah. Because the, the folk in Germany badly want one. So if you can give me a spare copy of it, uh, and I'll be glad to buy it off you and ship it off to Germany. That'd be great. Okay, so... Um, the, the, the General Conference men called in Will and the and said, now look, it's just possible that God does want this thing to go out before the church and we're prepared to put this thing to the test, so let's you and we say nothing further about this either for or against and if God wants it, he'll raise it up in some other direction. Now it so happened that there were 30 copies of the manuscript that had been produced on a duplicator and the General Conference very, very thoroughly searched to bring every one of those in their possession and locked them up out of sight and sound. They were 29, couldn't find the 30th one, and the 30th one found its way out of Los Angeles to a, a, a lady out there in the Adventist Church who sent it to Al Hudson in Baker, Oregon. He read it through and saw its deep significance, and he had conversations with Will and sure I think as well, he knew them personally anyway, and um, he then proceeded to make his own appeals to the General Conference and when the General Conference wouldn't hear him at any level whatsoever he said, right, I've now gone to them directly, i will now lay it before the entire church and the next thing we knew there were thousands of copies being offered all over the world of this manuscript. Right. And you begin to imagine what a dramatic effect this had upon the minds of Adventists seeking for an answer to the perplexing and deepening problems in the church. Now in the meantime, without knowing about this, there was a family in Australia called the Brinsmeads who had uh, more than just a passing interest in and a fair knowledge of what took place back in 1888. And the names of Wagon and Jones have become familiar to them, although, as, uh, as those of us who have been in the Adventist Church for, for many years will testify, until the awakening came, the names, of Wagon and, the names of Wagon and Jones were completely unknown in Adventist circles. You know, when you were Abe, yeah. right? Yeah. And I, was, I personally was a very keen student of Adventist church history, but I never ever had gained access to the slightest information about Wagner and Jones until the awakening began. Now one day at Avondale College in Australia, where, which, which is just a few miles from where sister White lived for quite a number of years, I've seen the house where she used to live, down there in Australia. It's now a museum, you can go there as a, it's a heritage thing in memory of Sister White, you can walk in and walk around and see books that she wrote, handwriting and so on, so on, you know, all this sort of stuff. And um, at Avondale College one day, the librarian said to several young men, go into the library storeroom, that old room back there was getting full, full of discarded books, and go through the books and pick out what's no more good and throw them away and um, just keep what's worth keeping. Now, not one book by Wagner and Jones that had been in the library shelves for decades upon decades. They're all lying gathering dust in these back rooms. The bulletins and uh, Consecrated Way and, uh, and so on and so on and so on. And um, so they went in and as they searched for these old boxes of books, they found volumes by Wagner and Jones. They, as they read through them to check them out, they said, well, here's really something special and they took the books back to their rooms. Some books were sent to Queensland where a Dr. Boyd got a typist to type the books out and mimeograph them. They were, they were extremely poor printing. They were very difficult to read. 
they overcrowded the margin, the spellings were bad, and you couldn't even trust the, the books to be correctly, correctly copied, but they had the message in them. And as these books began to circulate widely throughout the Australasian field, including, including New Zealand, people read them with hungry hearts, and there was a revival just as there was back in the days of Josiah. Now, when the Adventist Church became aware of the circulation, the reaction was spontaneous and extremely negative. And um, the message was branded as being schismatic, her heretical, perfectionist, and dangerous. And really, you, you'd have to live back there to realise how intense was the hatred and opposition the Seventh-day Adventist Church manifested toward that message. It was really something. And... Um, People, if they wanted to preserve their church office, had, and, and at the same time, Reed Wagner and Jones had, had to do so most secretly and most carefully. Well, the message reached me in New Zealand, and I had the conversion experience that you read about in Bondage to Freedom. And then the Brinsmeads um, began to, well, Brinsmead then wrote a paper called The Vision of the Heidekel, which was a study on Daniel chapter 11. And that got him expelled from Avondale College for teaching utter heresy. But I tell you that that little paper was quite a good one and uh, I don't think I had any quarrel with it at all. And um, down in New Zealand I also gave a study in the King of the North one day in one of the churches which told that the King of the North was, was the papacy and I was warned if I gave any more sermon about that I'd be out of my nose too. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember, I remember one Sabbath morning in, in Palmerston North Church I went in there and I took the book uh, Christ Object Lessons and I simply, I virtually only read to the people what the wedding garment was and pointed out and read the words of Sister Wife tell us that when we come to the great investigative judgment we'll have to stand with our spot or wrinkle any such thing. I never preached in that church again, never. They professed to believe the spirit of prophecy and I read it to them with, with my own powerful experience um, coming through. I, had, I, I gained the experience the message then. They didn't want to hear it and they, they requested... They probably request I never ever be given a church uh, preaching sermon in Palmerston North again. I never did, ever. Well then Brinsmead began to um, lock horns with the Australasian Division uh, Conference headquarters and uh, and there was a tremendous furor going on, people taking sides and, and the interest in the message was very extensive and then Brinsmead came to America at the beginning of 1960 and uh, worked here for about two years I think he kept coming across the border and going back in the next six months to his visa, but he was over here for a couple of years altogether. And uh, at the end of that time, the General Conference met in San Francisco, where they were called upon to to give heed to the message, but they passed it by and treated it very lightly and carelessly. Then came our separation from the church, which was forced upon us, and from that time on it's just been a matter of the message growing up and growing until we have it as it is today. And of course, if I was to tell you all the details of all the growth in those last 20 years, we'd be here for many, many hours. And I think you might get a little tired and bored by that time. <laughs> now, is there any, any additional questions you'd like to ask in regard to uh, this history or any other questions you'd like to bring forward? There was one more, not in relation to this history, but the particular verse in Hebrews 9, verse 8, about the way into the holiest not being made manifest the first time the tabernacle was done. I am. Well, that's fairly easily answered. I think the way into the holiest, the holiest referred to there, of course, is the, uh, the heavenly sanctuary. And um, the way into that holiest, of course, was not truly opened up until Christ went to heaven, opened the door to the holy place, and uh, the apostles upon this earth then saw where Christ was, and they sent their prayers up to him in that position. And knowing where he was and what he was doing there gave their prayers tremendous faith. Whereas in the Old Testament, whereas they ought to have looked from the type to the end of type, their eyes were holden and they were fixed upon the type. And it was not until Christ came and, and led them in by faith into the holy place that they that the way into the holiest was made manifest. Then that doesn't apply to certain individuals. No, no. It's people. No. No, no. Well, no. They, they, you mean David or? Yeah. By David. Well, he he certainly realised that the sanctuary was in heaven. Oh, sure. Well, there's always individuals. There's always individuals who uh, understood the truth for their time, but they were, but they were few in number. Whereas Paul speaking in general terms of the general situation, not the exception, but the general situation, makes it plain that the way was not manifest to the average church people. 
Any further questions? So a statement by <coughs> Mr. White that says that in the end times we're to use the Bible and the Bible alone? Uh, no. Uh, I mean, well, I've never read it, and um, I personally believe that... Um, I, I find, for instance, that um, there's no problem with people who accept this message and the spirit of prophecy. Uh, I've seen people come in from the uh, Mormon Church, from the Catholic Church, from the uh, Presbyterian Church, from uh, the Church of England, straight from the world, and we've never had to prove the spirit of prophecy to them. They just recognize in it the voice of God. And uh, during the last days, the information contained in these books, of course, will be accepted by the people, plus uh, the, the written revelations of God's word or prophetic word are not yet complete because when we come to the last days, which is very soon, and you folk are all prophets and get messages from God, you'll write them out. And that'll be the spirit of prophecy too. And the people will accept it as well. The same as people accept the sister wife when she was alive amongst them. <coughs> same thing. Right. Now I'd like to read a statement from page 373. Sometimes, as when we leave the Seventh Day Adventist Church, of course, um, we leave behind us a lot of very wonderful friends and very fine people, and uh, it breaks our hearts to think that they're staying behind all that coldness. They don't need to be sorry for those people because they are being very, very faithfully watched over by angels, and they'll be kept by those angels until the time comes when the loud cry message reaches them. And I'll read that to you in Great Controversy, page 372 and to page 373. Now this, this by the way, is a statement which, which applies directly to what took place back in 1844, but it also applies today for the simple reason that this, in 1844, we had the first fulfillment of the prophecy of Matthew 25. Today we're having the second fulfillment of that, and Sister Wise says the parable of the ten virgins has been fulfilled or has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. Now if the has been and will be are both to the very letter and they must equal each other, mustn't they? So what happened in the first fulfillment must again happen in the second. So here's what happened in the first fulfillment and the same thing is happening today in the second. Angels of God were watching with the deepest interest the result of the warning. When there was a general rejection of the message by the churches, angels turned away in sadness. Right, now let's stop right there. Now, has there again been a general rejection of the warning given? And the answer is yes. Have angels again turned away in sadness? They certainly have. But there were many who had not, been, who had not yet been tested in regard to the Advent truth. Now, in the Seventh Day Adventist Church today, there are many, many people who have never even heard about this crisis. Right? They haven't even heard about it. They have no idea what's going on. They're as innocent as babies. Um, many were misled by husbands, wives, parents or children and were made to believe that a sin, uh, a sin even to listen to such heresies were taught by the Adventists. Now is that a, a, an accurate opinion of today's situation? Absolutely. Now listen. Angels were bidden to keep faithful watch over these souls for another light was yet to shine upon them from the, the throne of God. So those folks out there who are honest, who are God's true children, who are going to come out eventually, are being watched there with great faithfulness by very, very faithful angels, angels who know how to obey and how to believe. And when the final crisis comes, they're going to come out and take their stand with God's people. So don't worry about them. Don't even weep over them because they're in good shape and in good hands. A description is given in the book early writings of when they will awaken to the final message, when they will come out to respond to that message. And um, I think now it's in the chapter, um, mm -hmm. the shaking, right? Yeah, I've got it now in my mind. I forgot it for the moment, but it uh, should be two seven right page. Um, no, stop the shaking either. It's, it's there, but move the illustrate. It should be page 243. Keep my bearings straightened out eventually. Mm -hmm. No, I still lost it. Let me think a minute. Get um, the chapter this is in. Um, should be... Uh, should be in this chapter. Let 
No, where's the shaking? That's correct, yeah. It's got to be. Yes, here it is, page 271. Early writings, page 271. Now, in this chapter, we um, are brought down to the outpouring of the latter rain, and it says, I heard those clothed with the armour speak forth the truth with great power. And those clothed with the armour were those who were previously separated and, and had been in the school of the prophets and had been filled with the power of God. It had effect, many had been bound, some wives by their husbands and some children by their parents. The honest who had been prevented from hearing the truth now eagerly laid hold upon it, right? So the honest ones who are now in the Seventh-day Adventist Church and who today are kept away from the truth will then eagerly lay hold upon that truth. The, the um, All fear of their relatives was gone and the truth alone was exalted to them. They had been hungering and thirsting for truth and it was dearer and more precious than life. I asked what had made this great change. Now, what great change? The change between those folk being locked away from the message and they're opening up to the message. And the answer was, it is the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, the loud cry of the third angel. So first of all, in Great Controversy, page 373, we read about um, many being held back from hearing the message by their relatives and friends. But here in the writings, of course, we read about um, their being delivered from that bondage by the mighty power of God's Spirit to the latter, to the latter rain. So there's, there's a picture that will comfort you all so that when you find yourself called upon to separate from the Seventh day Adventist Church, you can leave behind you those who are at, at the moment still bound by ignorance and by relatives and friends, and you say to yourself, now I'm going out for their sake to get some schooling so when I'm schooled, I can, I can be sent back by God to be a missionary to these people whom I am not yet fit to save or to help, right? So with that thought in mind, of course, you can go out to get something to take back to them when the time comes under God's all-wise management and, uh, and wisdom. What was the page in the 271, I think. Yeah, 271. 271, yeah. Very good. Now let's um, just spend a few moments considering the significance of baptism. And this because when we come back this afternoon we're going to have a little bit too short a time to have an actual service then so we'll spend about 11 or 12 minutes now on this subject in preparation for the baptism at 1.30 this afternoon we'll need to assemble here or there I guess we can all assemble there can we? at the best we'll talk about it after the study period is over let's turn to Romans the, the 6th chapter and in Romans the 6th chapter we have um, what must be described as the best um, Discourse anywhere in the Word of God on the subject of baptism. And uh, we find Paul asking the question in verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not, or don't you know, <clears throat> that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also shall walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. <coughs> now the... Um, the Apostle talked here about being baptised into Jesus Christ, which is a very different thing from being baptised in a church organisation or into a, th a theory of the truth or a series of ideas and, and so forth. <clears throat> and then he explains what it means to be baptised into Jesus Christ as being baptised into his death. So we can again rise up, of course, in newness of life. Now, the death that Christ experienced on Calvary's cross was the death of the old man because he took our old nature to the cross together with him and put that nature to death. And therefore, in the first instance, baptism is a state on, on our parts that something already has taken place, <coughs> namely that um, the old offspring of Satan has been uprooted, the spirit of disobedience has been taken away, and in his place, the spirit of obedience has been put by the, 
by the indwelling power of God's presence and spirit. Now, if a person has not actually experienced that, then their baptism, of course, is a false statement. If they have experienced it, then their baptism is a true statement of a true experience, and they can know that, that heaven and earth witnesses to this. Now, in the second instance, baptism is a consecration of ourselves to God forevermore, and for this reason should not be lightly entered into. In other words, just as a marriage, in a marriage you promise to love, honour and cherish till death do us part, inasmuch as the baptism is the actual marriage service for the Christian, we promise Jesus Christ to love, honour and cherish him until death do us part. Which means, of course, full subscription to the Sabbath rest principles and identification or identification with the members of the body of Christ. Now, of course, we don't baptise into a movement as such, we baptise into Jesus Christ, but to be baptised into Jesus Christ is to be baptised in the family of Christ, right? Yes. And the family of Christ is made of many members. And uh, we are to recognise, of course, that uh, if we think the Seventh-day Adventist Church is still the Church of God, that's where we should be baptised, because we are then baptised into that membership. But if we believe this to be the truth of God, then here's where we are, where we are baptised, because we then recognise this to be where the members of the body of Christ are found, and we're going to take our stand with those members, very obviously. Now, there's nothing which I find so sad as to have a person approach me this year and say, I want to be baptised, and I say, well now, do you really know what you're doing? Yes, I know what I'm doing. And is, is, do you really intend now to stand faithful to your vows? And I say, yes, we'll never give up the message. So, the baptism takes place, and I come back 12 months later, what are they doing? They probably married someone out in the world, not, not in every case, of course, but in certain instances. And... Um, they're now living a worldly life and, and have totally given up altogether the principles of God's word. Now this is a very un unfortunate thing. Now it's better not to marry than to marry and get divorced. Isn't that right? And it's likewise better not to be baptised than to be baptised and give the message up. So very, very great care should be taken on the part of the person involved and make certain that... Uh, the dedication being given in baptism is a truly solid, sound and genuine one so that when the pressures of temptation come, the person says, I have made my vows, I shall stand by those vows no matter what the cost may be. I have my orders and I'll, I'll obey those orders right through until the bitter end. If we'll do this, of course, then we, we, we can stand. Now, of course, I know there's always the possibility of a person becoming discouraged and failing and um, so we can never guarantee that because you make the dedication today in all sincerity that we're going to maintain that dedication. But at the same time, because the dedication is so long-lasting and so solemn, a person should be very, very thorough in checking himself out to make sure he will, or at least has a, a, has a, a, a true and serious determination to stand faithful to, to his vows. Now thirdly, baptism does not signify the attainment of perfection. It signifies entry into the school of Christ. Now folks say, well yes, uh, why say entry into the school of Christ? Because surely before that time a person uh, has to learn some things about the gospel and therefore is in the school of Christ. Not exactly. Before baptism, a person is, or before conversion I should better say, a person is being called or invited to enter the school of Christ and certain arguments are put to him or her as the case may be um, urging upon him the, um, the advantages to be found in that particular school. It's like studying brochures. You learn about the school, you learn about the experience and how to meet the entrance qualifications. And having learned the entrance qualifications and applied the entrance qualifications, you then are taken out of Satan's school into the school of Jesus Christ and the real education of your life begins. And this, of course, is the Reformation process. In the Reformation process, old habits have to be uprooted, old ideas and theories must be exchanged for new truths, and we're going to find, of course, that um, while uh, conversion or the revival experience took away certain very real problems, it didn't remove all the sin problems from our lives, and Reformation will do for us what revival couldn't do, just as revival, first of all, does what Reformation couldn't do. Reformation is the is the uprooting of the spirit of disobedience, the implantation of the spirit of obedience, it's taking away of the old evil nature and the implanting in the person of the new life altogether. 
and when that experience has been attained then the training process begins it's just too sad to see a parent or a person for that matter spend a lifetime training up a thorn bush it's a much better idea to train up an apple tree or an orange tree isn't it the training is vitally important we have two things we have first of all we must have the good tree then the training of that good tree or we must have the spirit of obedience or the life of Christ and then the training process follows that um, and without both of these works being done we cannot attain fitness for the kingdom that's why parents must be wise educators and um, we don't make the mistake of being arresting content when the child does experience the new birth or has a spirit of obedience we now must take advantage of that spirit to train that child in the way that he should go and make sure he, gets, he, he or she gets adequate spiritual food day by day to grow up in the way that God has appointed and so then the schooling process begins in earnest and goes on for the rest of our lives and at the present time naturally with the tremendous work before us with graduation day looming closer and closer we need to especially devote ourselves to that training process or that education so that when the, um, the time comes we shall be found prepared and ready to fill our appointed task and place now of course baptism is an opportunity for those who witness it to rededicate themselves to God's service on the terms of the original covenant to think back on all the wonderful mercies of God and the victories gained to review the promises of God and to enter with refreshed confidence into whatever the future may hold for us in turn and it's also our dedication to stand by the candidates that um, they can know that we shall uphold them by our prayers that we shall be real brothers and sisters to them real co-workers and, and co-soldiers in the battle against sin and we'll, and we'll regard the interests and reputations of each other with jealous care praying always of course for never deepening unity of love so that we can be a united force and give discredit to Satan's lies and charges against the government of God so then as we go forth to this afternoon's baptism at 1.30 we can do so with hearts full of confidence and courage and look forward to a blessed fellowship there and in the years which follow that any questions you'd like to ask in regard to baptism or rebaptism? yes <laughs> I didn't have the question perfectly formed but, um, there was a number of instances of people being baptized with John's baptism mm -hmm. and um, and then also people being baptized into Christ and then not being baptized with the Holy Spirit and then the apostles had to lay hands on them I wonder if you could clarify those um, are, you, are you saying that those were baptized by John were rebaptized by the apostles later? yeah uh -huh. yeah well um, it should, uh, I'm just a little bit surprised that um, those who were baptized at John's baptism should needed any further baptism because John really preached repentance and the new birth experience he, he, he upheld the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world and baptism is not re-baptism does not signify merely an entry into a deeper knowledge of God's word re-baptism is for those who have been formally baptized into a church organization before when they recognize that their baptism was only was only a statement of loyalty, loyalty to a church organization and not a baptism into into an experience or a declaration of an experience now the baptism of the holy spirit of course is something else again altogether different from that the baptism of the holy spirit is the descent of the holy spirit's reign to submerge our souls in the power of god so we can then go forth to witness to the truths of god's word and there can be quite a long training period between the water baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and many, most of us here for instance have experienced water baptism in the past which we, by which we testify of being born again Christians today we're in school and we shall get the baptism of the Holy Spirit until um, some future date when the time comes and yet with these people it was almost right after yes because they lived in the time of power didn't they they lived in the time when the Holy Spirit had been given and the, and the former rain was falling whereas the latter rain has not yet come and we will find likewise that when when we baptize folk during the loud cry period that they'll get the their water baptism and step out of the water and get their holy spirit baptism on the spot many times christ did when he, when he stepped out of the water the, the holy spirit came right away now and uh, so it's a different a different context than the, than the present context any further questions right well let's um 
think then the tapers now stop so we can think uh, in respect, in respect to organising the baptism itself. Now, if everyone knows where the place is, we can meet there at one thirty, or do we need to all come back here and follow each other down there? How many folk who have cars don't know where to go? Is it at the church where we were? No, where is, where is it, uh, Henry? It's the Surrey Rec Centre. Oh. Do what?